Well, it's really nice to see everyone tonight. Uh, for those of you who are here uh, live and for those of you who hopefully will be watching this later, it's really good to welcome you. Thank you for all those who are supporting us by Patreon and become supporters maybe since the last time we met. It's really good to welcome you all. Um, uh, this will be recorded, so you'll be able to go back over it again uh, in the future if you need to. So I am in the sort of coming to the end, sort of the end of a talking about unconditional love and unconditional love really has been the focus of in my life really for quite a number of years and the experience I've had of unconditional love have really changed my whole belief system concerning who God is therefore the reach of God's love towards all of creation and my experiences of unconditional love have challenged my view of, of God challenged my view of many things I used to believe doctrines and traditions and various things God's love is unconditional if it isn't unconditional it's not love and I think that is the key factor if you put a condition on love then it's something you're earning by fulfilling a condition and God's love is unconditional otherwise it can't be love and it is unconditional for everyone and everything and that love has no boundaries no limitations no barriers and I believe God wants everybody to know his love but unconditional love has so challenged some of the belief systems I've had that some of the things I believe I now realize are nothing really but religious tradition and myth and some of the doctrines that I believe kept me in bondage and didn't enable me to experience unconditional love so now unconditional love has set me free as I've experienced that unconditional love in my relationship with Jesus and the Father through the Spirit now only our experience of unconditional love i believe is going to bring us freedom from the religious deception that most of us have had in our lives in various forms and if you've never been uh, brought up in any wrong religious setting you know praise god but for most of us we have things that we probably struggle with or we've not really understood or we really have believed things which now we know aren't really true and that's so so true for myself there are so many things that I now realize that were conditioned, programmed by my upbringing, by my religious uh, experiences in church and other things. So in previous sessions, we've looked at some of the truth around some of those things, which I now believe God is trying to bring us out of. So our view of sin of forgiveness, repentance, confession, faith, being born again, salvation, the Bible, restoration of all things, other other areas. But you, I think the thing that really challenged me probably the most and was probably uh, more and more difficult for me was when looking at the power of love and how the power of God's love the power of the resurrection how uh, that love overcame death that then brought me face to face with what happens to people after they die and I realized that I was programmed by a religious belief which I now call the hell myth hell in inverted commas because the english word hell is not actually a biblical word at all but that myth really held sway in my life even though really i wasn't really convicted over it in the sense of it wasn't my conviction um through personal study or anything it was just well i guess that is what it is i didn't really like it but it was an issue so I believe that unconditional love is the very essence of who God is. God's character, its nature, our reflection of who he is, and he cannot change depending on the situation. He's not the Old Testament God, the New Testament God. He's God, Father, Son, Spirit, and God is love. God is light. God is spirit. God is a consuming fire. So with God, there are no situational ethics. He is consistent. He is reliable. He doesn't change. Therefore, we can depend on him. We don't have to be afraid of him. He's not going to be inconsistent. One day he's going to be happy with us. And the next day, well, he might be a bit grumpy. We've got out of the bed the wrong side. Not that God really has a bed, of course. But in reality, we've got to be realizing that he doesn't change. He's the same. And when we realize that, that gives us a great degree of security. We don't have to be afraid that he's going to change or he might change his mind about us or we might not have done it good enough you know and all of us and i i was think for my own life when i was a teenager you know i just never was sure what well, did i pray the right prayer did i pray it in my heart good enough so i was always 
sort of insecure about my salvation because it was down to did did I do it well enough? Well, now I realize it's totally about what Jesus did on the cross, not what I do. I just come to a realization of that. So God is the same yesterday, today and always will be because he's I am that I am. That is a statement that says I will never be anything other than who I am. And he is love. Now, religion always creates doubt about how good and loving God is and introduces fear into the picture because that keeps people in line. You have to toe the line if you're afraid that you might be punished by God if you don't. Now, God does not want to treat us in such a way that he wants us out of fear to respect him and honour him. And you certainly won't love someone out of fear because we love because he first loved us. We don't love him because we're afraid if we don't, something bad might go on. Or do we? Because that's probably where I was, was in some of my life. Now, there are some Bible verses which over the years have been quite challenging to me. And when I really got to grips with what they were saying, were comforting to me because they were really challenging the whole concept of the power of God's love and how powerful God's love is. Perfect love casts out fear. Um, one of them is Song of Solomon 8, verse 6 and 7. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as severe as Sheol, or the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. So love is the flame of the Lord. It is the fire of God's nature. That's love. And he's jealous for us. Not jealous in a way that he's jealous in a negative way as a, as a negative emotion, but he wants the best for us. And his love is more powerful than death and the grave and has overcome it. Verse seven says, many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. In other words, nothing we can do can match up to the power of the love of God and that verse um, those verses are also in a song um, called you won't relent and the, the, the line in the song goes you won't relent until you have it all and that means God wants all of us he wants every one of us and that love will not relent until God has a relationship with everyone that and everything that he has created now, Romans chapter eight also talks about the love of God. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Now, of course, these are terminology which they would have ex experienced in the days that this was written. They were living in the Roman Empire, which functioned on the basis of peril and sword. And there were a lot of things going on during those days which were very difficult for them to face. And they were being persecuted by the religious People, they were being persecuted by the political people. It was a very difficult time in which to live. And they were in that time, the context of that time, waiting for Jesus to come and bring an end to their suffering and persecution and bring them into a whole new life. Um, so who will separate us from the love of Christ? No one. No one and nothing. Verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. So the fact that God loves us enables us to overwhelmingly conquer tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword. Because he loves us. And when we know he loves us, we do not have to doubt if negative things or some difficult things happen in our lives, the love of God. Because God didn't bring about those things. Those things are a result of the world in which we live in, sometimes even the result of our own decisions and the consequences of the things we've done but even when they are god loves us and wants to bring good out of it because his mercy is triumphant and his mercy is triumphant over everything else verse 38 says for i am convinced that neither death nor life now there's the two first things i'm convinced that neither death nor life can separate us from the love of god so if you die that won't separate you from the love of God. In life, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Now, ultimately, the reality of that is what you believe you will live in accordance to. So although 
God's love is there, we may not realize it. So Paul basically is writing here and saying, for I am convinced, and that's a very strong statement. That is, I am absolutely, totally sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. So nothing that we're living with now or nothing that may come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, that is a huge statement, and it is absolutely true. And God wants us to know unconditionally that nothing can separate us from his love. So we can stay in that place where we are experiencing and enjoying the peace and rest that comes from knowing that we're loved unconditionally and we are enjoying and experiencing that amazing wonderful love i want to read this again in the mirror bible uh, romans 8 35 what will it take to distance us from the love of christ you name any potential calamity intense pressure of the worst possible kind cluster phobia persecution destitution loneliness extreme exposure life-threatening danger or war Verse 38, this is my conviction. No threat, whether it be in death or life, be it angelic beings, demon powers, principalities, political principalities, nothing known to us at this time, or even in the unknown future, no dimension of any calculation in time or space, nor any device yet to be invented, has what it takes to separate us from the love of God, the love that, that God demonstrated in Christ. Jesus is our ultimate authority. So that is a statement that came from Paul's experience of knowing the love of God in his own life, of going into the realms of heaven and experiencing the revelation firsthand, of having a revelation that Jesus was already in him, at work in him, before he even came to realize it, which is why Paul preached a gospel of, of unconditional love, a gospel of inclusion, that we're all included in that love. Now, he wasn't just talking to the Romans here. That nothing can separate you from the love of God. He was talking to everyone because Jesus died for the sin of the whole world and he has reconciled the whole cosmos to himself and holds nothing against anybody. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So death is not the doorway into eternal life as we've been taught. Death is the enemy of the Father and ours as well Dare you believe that the last enemy to be destroyed is death? And that was a statement I found yesterday, actually, online by Don Keithley. Actually, death has been defeated already. Resurrection power of God has already caused everyone to be born from above again, in a sense. And therefore, they are alive in the spirit. It's a recognition of that, which is the issue. Realization of what Jesus has already done in defeating death in overcoming the grave for us. Therefore, death has no sting. Death has no power unless we choose to give it such power. So the power of unconditional love even overcomes death and the grave. Nothing can separate us from love. Therefore, God, because God is love, that was the early church father's message. But actually, it's not the message of the modern evangelical community mostly. And I think today the message has been somewhat changed and it's a gospel of exclusion rather than inclusion. Now, I believe religion creates conditions that make love attached to those conditions that we can never keep. Therefore, we're always striving to keep something and always in bondage to try to be good enough. Whereas if we recognize that we weren't good enough in the first place and now we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, then it's all his work and not ours. But the consequences of our failures are used to keep us following the rules. Now, one of the biggest consequences of failure is the threat of punishment in, quote, hell and eternal conscious torment in that place. And that is what's been used as a good news message for a long time. And actually, it's pretty bad news. Now, why would we want to believe in a God who is going to torment and punish eternally his children? Well, that isn't the God I know, but a lot of people still are in fear of that. So we've got to engage the love of God to remove the fear of punishment and torment and hell and that concept. So I was theologically convinced um, that 
the hell that I thought um, existed didn't. Um, so my understanding of hell, quote, was flawed, but that wasn't enough. I needed more than a theological convincing, because I was theologically convinced before, I guess. Uh, I needed the experiences that produced the cognitive dissonance to enable my beliefs to be transformed by those experiences. So God took me on a journey and took me and showed me the reality of what happens uh, in death, what happens after death, what happens at the point of death, and what happens to people if they die in a state of not realizing what Jesus has done and accepting that, what happens to those people? So God knows me enough to know that I want to see it and I want to experience it so that I know and have a testimony of the truth and I'm not just giving information. So in one sense, everything I'm sharing today comes out of my personal experience, which I am absolutely 100% convinced of, because my experiences produce such challenge to what I used to believe that I could no longer believe it. Um, but God was gracious and merciful and showed me the reality. But for most Christians, hell, eternal conscious torment are sort of sacred cows and they're sort of fixed immutable doctrines that most people just couldn't believe there's another way of looking at it. Well, I believe the world in general has rejected a slur on the character and nature of God who's unconditional love. And yet uh, most of the church has accepted that slur on the character and nature of God that he would in any way torment his children forever in fire and burn them and give them a body that will never ever wear out so they can be burned forever i mean is that a loving god not from my experience and he's not like that at all so i could not really do a series on unconditional love and not mention the sort of the elephant in the room which is hell and eternal conscious torment and all of those things so what does happen to people after they die? It's an important question to ask because a lot of people are fearful of what will happen to them after they die. And if we have the answers to help them, we can both help them make the right choices before they die. And if they do die, hopefully they can also accept what happens after they die. So is death more powerful than unconditional love? Well, absolutely not. Because unconditional love has overcome death. So my personal experiences where Jesus and the Father shown, shown me what happens to people after they die, where they go into the consuming fire of God's presence, into the consuming fire of his love, gives me absolute full confidence in the fact that death is not the end of choice for anybody and that unconditional love wins in the end because God is patient, God is kind, God will never give up, love will never fail. Therefore, that love will win over everyone in the end so that they will experience that love for themselves. Now, I didn't used to believe that because I was conditioned like everyone else. You must make a condition. You must make a, a choice for Jesus before you die, because if you die, you're going to go to hell. Now, that was the gospel that I had heard over and over again. I never preached it because I didn't really feel in my heart good about that. So I never preached that, but I did believe it. Now I realize that my belief was conditioned by the upbringing and the churches i had been involved with and particularly evangelical community that I was part of for most of my adult life. Um, and now I realize that Jesus and the Father took me into the fire, showed me that you can preach to people in the fire and that people in the fire can respond to that preaching and they can be reconciled back to a relationship with God and come into the love of God and become part of the cloud of witnesses. and enter into their eternal destiny now a lot of people struggle with that but i've experienced it over and over and over again jesus took me there showed me it now i will go into quite a lot of those experiences in future sessions but i want to give a foundation today for why i do not believe in the traditional evangelical view of hell and penal uh, retribution and essentially eternal conscious torment I don't believe in that because it's not consistent with the nature of God and love. How can God keep no record of wrongs and then punish anyone for the wrongs that they've done? Jesus has already nailed every accusation to the cross and dealt with it. So I've been to the consuming fire with God and on my own many times, and I've seen God's love in action and God's love and the fire is purifying and refining 
And I've seen that power at first hand to bring about the transformation in someone's life when they accept and realize that God loves them, even after they've died and even after all the things they might have done in their life in rejecting Jesus. But love wins. So the fire of God's love never fails, never gives up, and love wins in the end. And the restoration of all things is foundational in that. And the restoration of all things is because that the love of God will never fail and God will never stop loving until people come into a relationship with him because he created us for relationship. He created creation for relationship. So where does our understanding about, quote, hell come from? Well, in the early Hebrew scriptures, it didn't mention at all. And in the sort of Hebrew context, really, that hell concept came only after the Babylonian exile and from further Greek influences. But Jesus's teaching has been used to affirm the concept of hell or the theology of hell. But I believe this is an eschatological misunderstanding because the teaching that Jesus had about the end and what would happen at the end was not talking about the end of time with any judgment and resurrection at the end of time and therefore some people being assigned to be punished at the end of time when jesus was talking about the end he was not talking and referring about the end of time but he was talking about the end of the old covenant age and there was fire and judgment associated with that because the system was judged and it was judged as having failed to produce righteousness now jesus used terms and terminology that they would understand to do with judgment and with fire now these were generational issues jesus said all these things were going to take place within that generation those things have been wrongly applied to the end of the world and associated with eternal conscious torment in the fire of god's judgment in hell well actually it's not the fire of his judgment it's the fire of his love so these events are not separate what happened at the end of the age and what happened in the terminology of where people would have been thrown into Gehenna, the fiery rubbish dump outside Jerusalem, are not separate. They're the same event. They're referring to the same end of the age judgment, not the end of the world, as we've been led to believe. Therefore, it's an eschatological issue. And if we realize that Jesus concept of the end was not the end of the world but the end of the age then neither was Gehenna which is a word used translated wrongly as hell also is not talking about the end of the world thousands of years later but the same generation so the connection between Jesus' teaching about the end of the old covenant age and apparent fiery judgment is used to promote an infernalist theology but they're referring to the same thing it is not the end of the world and it's not eternal judgment at all because actually the judgment that has been passed is we've all been passed innocent, which is really, really important that we get hold of that. We have been passed innocent. We've been judged innocent, not guilty, righteous, justified. So there's no need for punishment. Now, all the Bible verses quoted to affirm the belief in hell as penal retribution of eternal conscious torment are already realized and fulfilled and do not need to apply to any of God's children today or to anybody or anything today. Now that's really good news. Rather than the fear inducing, manipulating news that we've all got a, people who don't know Jesus are going to end up in hell. You know, now that's not good news. That is using fear to change people to accept Jesus. Well, it's no different than using the sword in the time of christendom believe jesus or be put to the sword which is what happened and this is the same thing believe in jesus or go to hell now when we look with fresh eyes and with an open heart i believe we'll find that death is not the end of choice that people can accept what jesus has done whilst in the refiner's fire of his loving presence after death now i would defy anybody to come up with one bible verse that says that death is the end of choice there are no bible verses that say it the only one used by anybody is the one about you know after death the judgment well actually that's not talking about physical death and it's not actually talking in the context that we've been told at all in in hebrews but ultimately 
I would ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to bring you the revelation of the Father's heart towards what happens to people after death and what is the concept of his fiery love. So I believe every knee will bow to Jesus. Every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord voluntarily in the consuming fire or hopefully before or on their deathbed. They won't be forced to as something, well, everyone will, but they will be forced to. Again, how can you confess Jesus as Lord by being forced to do so? It's something you have to do by conviction and desire. You can't be forced to say, well, Jesus is Lord if you don't mean it. The very nature of saying he's Lord is you accept his Lordship. You can't just say it. So I believe everyone will say it voluntarily because they will believe it and they will experience it. So I would not want anyone to end up in the consuming fire that I have seen people in. I want people to know Jesus now in this life and be part of the solution in this life by sharing that good news of what they've experienced in the love of God. I don't want anyone because they have chosen to reject Jesus as Lord or, or never really heard the gospel or any other way that they have not yet realized that Jesus loves them and the Father loves them. I want anyone to go into the consuming fire. But if they do, there are consequences within that fire. And those consequences are not pleasant for the people in that fire because they have a concept in their own understanding about what that fire is about. And often the people I've seen there are in torment in their soul, overwhelmed with guilt, shame and condemnation, which is not what God is doing. And his fire wants to overcome the guilt, shame and condemnation and to bring them out of torment and bring them into a relationship so they receive the salvation which is already theirs. And we are actually ambassadors of reconciliation. We have a ministry of reconciliation to help people realize that they are already reconciled to God and that God holds nothing against them and wants them to enter a relationship with him. And I don't believe trying to frighten them into accepting God is the right way to do it. Love is the answer. And we can love them in an unconditional way, the same way that God loves us. And unfortunately, many people are not loved that way because we've focused on the negatives of behavior and the unacceptability of behavior rather than the acceptance of what God has done in the inclusion that everyone is included in the work of the cross. So God is not taunting anyone, but facing the realization of self-righteous DIY choices, do-it-yourself choices is torment for many in that place. Now I've gone and preached to those to bring them out of that torment. So have many other people that I know. Everyone reaps the consequences of what they've sown but they're not punished by God and God's mercy will overcome the consequences of our choices because God wants to bring good out of even the worst choices. And the worst choice you could ever make is rejecting the offer of salvation that's available through Jesus. There is self-punishment and anguish of soul, but it's not God doing that. God wants to bring people out of it. So mercy triumphs over the consequences of our choices within the fire of God's love that consumes every objection of guilt, shame and condemnation and enables anyone to choose life in Christ. And I believe we will find that this is what the consuming fire is all about. And if you have doubts, ask God to take you there and show you. Because that's what he did with me. Now, I believe there is a link between happy realized eschatology, which is what I believe that all of the talk about end times and end things have already taken place. And what Jesus was talking about in the parable of like the sheep and the goats being in outer darkness, all of those things, weeping and gnashing of teeth, they're all revealing what it was to be outside of the covenant, be outside of the new covenant that was coming. And I believe all those things are already been realized at the end of the old covenant. Jesus prophesied it was going to take place and all those things would happen at the end of the old covenant system. That happened finally in AD 70. So outer darkness was figured to be outside the covenant or outside Jerusalem. Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem to die for the sins of the whole world. Jesus went into Sheol to the underworld to rescue everyone from that place and led captivity captive and took everyone out. 
Now, after the cross, that's our responsibility because Jesus did tell us that we could do everything he did and um, greater. So happy, realized, fulfilled or covenant eschatology places the end in the past. Most eschatological systems have far from happy endings for some or most people or created beings. I believe there is a good ending is going to be the restoration of all things. Most eschatological systems have expectations of fearful judgment, punishment, war, doom, gloom, destruction, misery, failure for mankind. I believe we are going to succeed in our sonship mandate to fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and bring the rule or kingdom of God so the kingdom of God fills the earth. But I'm not triumphalist in believing it's going to happen with a wave of a magic wand. It's going to happen as we see the kingdom of God like leaven infect the whole lump. So bit by bit. So in happy eschatology, there is a optimistic view of the future by realizing that the prophesied doom and gloom and judgment and destruction are things that have already been fulfilled, leading to a restorative period where all things will eventually be restored. The future is positive, filled with possibilities of increase and blessing. So in happy realized eschatology, all biblical references to the end, last days, end times, last hour, or things that are soon to take place. And the word soon to take place is the word mellow, and it does mean soon to take place, not shall take place sometime, but is soon to take place. And the whole book of Revelation was written from the book of this is soon to take place. And they're all referring to the end of the old covenant that Jesus prophesied would occur in that generation. There is no fear for the future based on biblical prophecy if it's past for us. So don't be afraid of the things which you've been told are coming. And there's still so much doom and gloom and misery out there in the prophetic world um, of all these terrible things are going to happen. And California's going to fall into the sea and earthquakes and judgment's going to happen because God is so angry with the world. God loves the world. He loved the world so much that he sent Jesus into the world to take away the sin of the world. He didn't bring doom and gloom and misery. He brought salvation. He saved us from being lost in our lost identity. So the end is past, not future. The end of the old heavens and earth, which was the nickname for the temple, is past, not future. The new heavens and the new earth is present, not future, because we are that expression of the new tabernacle. God dwells in us. The great tribulation is past and not future and will never happen again because it already happened. The end of the age is past, not future. Judgment and resurrection are past, not future in that sense. Because um, it was a covenant realization of what took place. So when Jesus said in Matthew 24, 34, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. He meant here. Heaven and earth will pass away the temple. But my words will not pass away. They will be fulfilled, in other words. Verse 21, for there, then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Verse 21 is before verse 34 that says all these things will take place, including the great tribulation. And it already took place between AD 66 and 70. So Jesus was talking to those who were believers in Judaism and were under the old covenant using language they understood in their day. Jesus was talking to that generation where all things he said would take place actually took place. Jesus actually said that all things written will be fulfilled during the events he was describing. Luke 18, 31. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. Luke 21, 22, because these are days of vengeance so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Now, this is about the curses of the covenant from Deuteronomy 30, which we're talking about vengeance, not in God on people, but the system being judged and found wanting. Jesus was the fulfillment of all the types and shadows and covenant and promises of God. And they're all now available to us. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes, therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. So all the promises of God are realized in Christ and are for us and are to be displayed through us to the world. So the world will come to a realization of that amazing truth. So let's make sure that we're in the fullness of the promises of God. 
don't live in the types and shadows of old covenant promises, live in the new covenant promises where all things are fulfilled in him. Now, most of the confusion around, quote, hell starts with the translation error. Four different words in Hebrew and Greek are translated into one English word, which is the word hell. They are Sheol, Hebrew, Hades, Greek, Tartarus, Greek, and Gehenna, Greek. So the word Sheol, um, which is sort of the underworld or the grave, really, really what it means is grave or pit. Um, now, if you read something like Strong's Concordance, uh, you'll see it says Sheol, H7585, which is the reference from H7592, Hades or the underworld of the dead as if a subterranean retreat, including its accessories and inmates, grave, pit, and then it says hell. But that isn't the meaning of Sheol. That is what we've attributed to the meaning of Sheol, because that's the modern understanding. It wasn't in the Hebrew meaning. So Sheol is 65 Old Testament occurrences. Most of you are actually just related to the grave or to the place dead souls depart to. Nothing to do with punishment in any way. And then we have Hades um, in again in Strong's G86, Hades from G1 and G1492 properly unseen. So really, it just meant unseen. That's what it really meant. That is Hades or the place or state of departed souls, grave. And then it says hell, which again is added because that's what the modern people think that they apply to it. But it isn't. Surprisingly, Hades only has 11 New Testament occurrences. Four times used by Jesus, none relating to punishment and none relating to hell, as, as evangelicals would quote it. Two uses of Hades in Acts, quoting Old Testament references to Sheol, relating to Jesus's death, having gone into the grave, into Sheol. One use in 1 Corinthians 15, referring to breaking the power of death. And four uses in Revelation. So 1 Corinthians 15, 15, where, O death, thy sting is your sting where are hades your victory so in other words the grave it won't have victory death won't have victory because now there's life in christ the resurrection is the victory luke 10 15 a new capernaum which unto the heaven was exalted unto hades you should be brought down so in other words they're going to go back into being unseen because it was talking about the concept of what was going on in their own self-righteous religious sense revelation 118 he who was living and and i did become dead now i'm reading from the literal translation here because it's not very easy to follow but actually these are literal words he was living and i did become dead and lo i am living to the ages of ages amen and i have the keys of the hades and of the death so this is jesus saying i have the keys of hades and of death and i've unlocked it not that I'm locking it up and you can't get out. Revelation 20, verse 14, and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So again, these are things. So death and Hades are going into the fire of God's love. And therefore, death will be overcome by love. Hades, or the grave, will be overcome by love. Love that is stronger than death. Jealousy more severe than the grave. Matthew 16, 18, and I will also say to you that you are a rock and upon this rock I will build my assembly, church, uh, ecclesia, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, none of that is talking about hell or punishment. It's just saying death will not overcome life, which is absolutely true, but we need reconditioning so that we don't read it and think hell, because that's what we've been taught to think. Now, then the other word is Tartarus, Tartaru um from tartaros the deep abyss of hades greek mythology the place where the titans were incarcerated so therefore there are some fallen angelic beings which are uh, imprisoned there um, now again if you then carry on the meaning to incarcerate in eternal torment cast down to hell that is not anything meaning of tartarus that is modern interpretation trying to make this mean hell that was an addition to the definition, which was completely made up. It's not in the original meaning at all. But it says it. If you read Strong's Concordance, Tartarus, G5 
2.0, it will say the place where Titans were incarcerated to incarcerate in eternal torment, cast down to hell. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. And nowhere in Greek does it mean that. That's a modern understanding, which is completely spurious, in fact. There's only one mention of Tartarus in 2 Peter 2 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus and committed them to the pits of darkness preserved for judgment. No hellish punishment mentioned there, just reserved for judgment. Well, what is judgment? A verdict. What is the verdict? Same verdict going to be based on what Jesus has done on the cross that all things in heaven, on earth, under the earth will be brought to the place where they will bow down and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, including those who are incarcerated there who are the watcher angels. Then you have Gehenna. And this is the Hebrew origin of this. Um, comes, if you read Strong's Concordance, the Greek word Gehenna, but it comes from a Hebrew origin, which is the Valley of Hinnon, Gehenna or Gehinnon, a valley of Jerusalem. Now, that literally was a physical place. It was a place known in the past in Israel for some terrible things that happened there, some child sacrifices and things where children were burning fire. But it was the rubbish dump that was outside of Jerusalem. Now, Gehenna is the word still translated in most modern versions of the Bible, like the NESB or AMP. Uh, in um, the Young's literal translation, there is no, not one word translated hell because it just uses the original words, which were the ones I quoted. But this one is still used. And this is the one that Jesus used most of the time. And he was referring to what would happen at the end of the old covenant age if people stayed in Jerusalem and did not follow him, uh, which all the Christians did, by the way, and left they would be ended up thrown into Gehenna, which was a sense where it was a rubbish dump where things were burning. So Gehenna comprises of 100% of Jesus' alleged references to hell, and it was a rubbish dump. Greek word for the Valley of Hinnon. It's a literal physical valley with a physical location outside the gates of Jerusalem. And you can find maps of it, and it's a valley, you know, and I've got some pictures of it in my notes, um, which describe where it is. So there are those scriptures, those Bible verses that refer to Gehenna as hell. What do those actually refer to? What do they symbolize? Are we prepared for the spirit to reveal the truth about them to us and not get stuck in tradition? Gehenna was a well known throughout Israel as evil and dark place used for a variety of evil acts throughout Israel's history. In the time of Hosea, the rebellious Israelites committed child sacrifice there to honor the pagan god Molech. 2 Chronicles 28, 3. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Ben-Hinnon and burned his sons in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. So they were going back doing things that others and other gods sort of required. So in Israel's history, Gehenna was literally a place of perpetual fire, a rubbish dump filled with so many bodies that worms would never die from lack of food. That's history. In the time of Jesus, that was the valley that contained so much trash thrown out from the besieged city walls that bodies would burn perpetually. That's an image, not of hell or eternal punishment, but of what would happen physically to people's bodies should they die. Jeremiah 19.6 says, Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place will no longer be called Topeth or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but rather the Valley of Slaughter. This was a prophetic statement referring to the destruction of the temple, Jerusalem, and the old covenant system in 86, 70. And it happened, but it wasn't God wanting to kill people. It was the result of the Romans and their rebellion that they brought about that judgment. And they brought about the end and the destruction of the temple, which brought about God's purposes. But if they had followed Jesus, they would have been saved from the destruction that took place in those days. So literally dead bodies were thrown into the dump during the time of Isaiah and they would again 40 years after Jesus spoke the words when the Romans besieged and destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70 or 66 to 70. So rather than eternal hell this was a physical place for dead bodies. 
And Jesus used the word Gehenna 11 times, but only in four different ways, mostly to describe the beliefs that are opposite to life in the kingdom. Nothing to do with punishment or eternal life or not, but to do with life in the kingdom. None of Jesus' uses were referring to torment, torture, punishment after death. So using the NESB, um, New American Standard Bible, we see there are 13 references in the New Testament, only uh, hell and 12 of them are Gehenna. Okay. One, Matthew 5, um, 29, Matthew 5, 30, Matthew 18, 19, Gehenna. Then the equivalent passages in Mark 9, 43, 45, 47. Uh, they're all the same concept. So this, all these six passages are really the same thing that Jesus was teaching. They're not six different variants. They're all really the same thing. So Matthew 10, 28, Gehenna. Matthew, Luke 12, 5, Gehenna. Matthew 5, 22, Gehenna. Matthew 23, 15, Gehenna. Matthew 23, 33, Gehenna. And then there are two outside of Jesus in the New Testament, James 3, 6, and then 2 Peter 2, 4, which is actually Tartarus, but that was used of Gehenna. So only four different uses of that by Jesus. So what did it mean? What was he talking about? What was Jesus trying to convey? Remember, Jesus came as the express image of God. He was telling them, if you've seen the Father, seen me, you've seen the Father. And he came to preach love. He came to preach salvation. So what was Jesus really talking about when he mentioned Gehenna? Every time Jesus is talking about kingdom life, not going to heaven or ending up in hell. Most occasions, Jesus was talking to the religious leaders when he used these terms. Mark 9, 43, for instance, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than, in, than having two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. Verse 44, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Physical rubbish dump, basically saying, and the same thing applied also in verses 45, 47, one foot or one eye, you know, cut off one foot, take out one eye. All those six occurrences are about the effects of sin on people's lives. Rather than discussing the afterlife, Jesus is using well-known local landmark to illustrate how significant and pervasive the destruction caused by sin is to our lives and relationships. Jesus is literally saying, that cutting off your hand will be less damaging to your life than a lifestyle of sin motivated by a lack of identity as our as sons. So if you don't know who you are and you live in, in out of that knowledge, then your life is probably going to end up in a less than kind of state than God intends. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to be fully healed, made whole and living in our own understanding out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will literally be a destructive force in our life and jesus was saying you know rather cut off your hand than end up being destroyed in that place which was associated with death nothing to do with the end of the world some streams of jewish thought view sin as self-inflicted judgment when you sin you inflict judgment upon yourself and actually even today i'm not i'm not saying i agree with this of course there is a belief amongst Orthodox Jews, some of them, that even what happened to them in history and how they are entreated right throughout history from the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 right through to present day was their own fault and that they deserve the judgment for the sins of Israel and the failure of the Jews to bring up the world into the knowledge of Yahweh, God. That's what they believe. Now, I don't believe that that is what God did or anyone did, but they believe it because they're so see the results of their disobedience to god is self-inflicted judgment that's extreme but it does give us an insight into the perspective that the jews uh, hearing god's word might have had when they heard him say better lose your eye or your hand or foot than end up being destroyed by sin sin isn't meaningless it's literally inviting hell pain and misery into our lives that's literally what this was trying to say and jesus was trying to get over to them you do not need to have this in your life follow me so jesus is using the most disgusting location in jerusalem to illustrate how destructive sin is and to encourage people to overcome it 
by following him. This freedom was a present invitation for them, not a future hope. So they could freely enjoy abundant life in their lifetime by following Jesus, rather than following a do-it-yourself path into self-destructive patterns, which would end up in death. James 3.6 actually says this, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by Gehenna. So in other words, it's the same thing. Things you say can actually cause your life to be destroyed or to be affected by what you say. The same concept, only non-gospel use of Gehenna. Now we know from 1 Corinthians 12, 26, that one part of the body can corrupt the whole body. Paul, Paul affirmed that. So we've got to be seeing this is the consistent with the teaching of Jesus and Paul. Now, the Pharisees were a religious sect who were all about perceived righteousness. They obsessively followed every directive of the law, made a continuous presentation of their cleanliness and piousness. They were self-righteous do-it-yourselfers. They were the epiphany of that. So the eighth and ninth feast of Gehenna that Jesus did was when he was saying, woe to you, Pharisees, scribes, hypocrites, Matthew 23, 15. Because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. When he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of Gehenna as yourselves. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of Gehenna? How indeed would they escape being destroyed and dying in the fire of the judgment that was coming on Jerusalem by following Jesus out of Jerusalem when he warned them to do? And he said, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, run to the hills and no believers were left in Jerusalem at that time. Now, there may have been those who came believers after who remembered what Jesus said, perhaps, um, but people followed Jesus's warning and they left. So Jesus was warning the Pharisees, not because he wanted them to die in Gehenna, because he wanted them to follow him out of Jerusalem and not be stuck in the old covenant system where they would ine inevitably physically die. And of course, they, they had no spiritual life either in that system. So Jesus was literally calling them children of the sewer. He was telling them that their own righteousness won't be enough to save them from being thrown out onto the dung heap. Now, Jesus loved them. It says that he wanted to gather them like a hen would gather her chicks under the wing, but they refused. They refused to do so because they were stubbornly following their own self-righteous religion. And eventually they were going to end outside the covenant, outside of Jerusalem anyway, where all the other dead people, when Jerusalem was finally destroyed and the temple was destroyed. Actually, some of those listening could have actually had their dead bodies dumped outside the city walls into Gehenna during the Roman siege to come. But they were proud of being children of Abraham, and now they were being called children of the refuse. That was insulting, but Jesus was trying to shock them and challenge them out of their self-righteous religion to follow him. The 10th and 11th Gehenna reference, Matthew 10, 28, Luke 12, 5, is where Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. This is somewhat difficult, to see what is Jesus trying to say here? Again, it's still talking about the same old covenant end. Um, he's still talking about that concept, but who are those who could kill the body? Um, you know, who could kill the soul? Well, who was Jesus talking about? One interpretation is where those who can kill the body, the religious leaders who did kill many, uh, fear him. Well, who are they going to fear? God or someone else? And one definition is they would fear the Roman Caesar, who would eventually destroy Jerusalem, along with all their hopes and dreams of the kingdom. Even if Jesus was talking about God and using Gehenna to mean hell, there's no concept of eternal death. torment in that verse. Just they're going to end up in that place. Um, and I don't believe Jesus was talking about that at all. I believe Jesus is saying that they should be more concerned about someone who can permanently destroy their body and soul, not punish it there. So ultimately, it was about the destruction of their lives if they didn't follow Jesus rather than punishment that would come from God. 
And the key is to destroy, not punish. The word destroy, which comes from apolumi, it doesn't mean punishment. It actually, even there's no indication, even if it was talking about God, that he would do, do it, just he could do it. But I don't believe it is meaning that at all. And the base and form of the word apolumi actually fully means to perish or, or to be lost or to lose. So the word destroy used in Mark 4, 38, for instance, is to describe the threat of perishing, either physically dying in the storm. Same word. Matthew 18, 11, the word destroy is also used to describe the mission of Jesus to seek and to save those which are lost. Same word, lost, not punished. It's not a word of perpetual torment, and there's no concept of hell or, or any eternal everlasting nature of it at all in that verse. So the idea of perpetual fire comes from the imagery of Gehenna. Even if we interpret Jesus to be figuratively referencing something that might be, there's no punishment or suffering to unbelieving humans there. It's much more likely that Jesus is referring to 80 to 70 destruction of Jerusalem, which they understood, and they were in context, uh, understanding that he was talking about them. Now, our Western concept of hell comes from pagan ideas. A lot of it comes through 14th century ideas of Dante's Inferno, uh, popularized in the 15th century by Hieronymus Bosch paintings and creates a totally fictitious doctrine that informs most popular culture today when you think of hell. But actually, it's not in the Bible in that way, and Jesus wasn't teaching it that way at all. Now, the last reference often used to derive the doctrine of eternal torture um, is found um, in Matthew 5.22. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you, you fool shall be guilty enough to be cast into the fiery Gehenna. Now, do we seriously think this is literal? And if you say to someone, you fool, you're going to be cast into the fires of hell forever and tormented forever it doesn't mean it the passage shows again the idea of literal Gehenna without suggesting eternal torture Jesus is raising the standard of what constitutes an offense to thoughts and emotions to emphasize how powerful our thoughts and words are however whoever heard of going to court uh, going to hell for being angry you know it's just Jesus used strong concepts to be to get over to them the power of anger and words of anger and unforgiveness in their lives. But it's nothing to do with hell. But it was talking about the concept of fiery death, but not physical death in this sense, but really talking about the power that destroys your life if you live in unforgiveness. So Jesus is really demonstrating how little it takes for sin to negatively affect us just a bit of unresolved anger like leaven pollutes our lives you know toxic thinking is poison to us unforgiveness is poison to our lives if you're at the point of actually despising your brother then destruction is already upon you and you're in the torture chamber of unforgiveness according to matthew 18 that's really what it's getting over the power that things have to destroy our lives rather than anything to do with some eternal conscious torment at the end of the world. So where do people go after they die? After they physically died in this life, or perhaps on their deathbed, having chosen to reject what Jesus did for them? Because I believe Jesus visits everyone on their deathbed and gives them an opportunity at that moment of accepting him, and many do. Is the fire where they go for punishment, torment, or refining and purifying and if you you can read scriptures in the old testament talking about the refiner's fire and the purifier and fuller soap purifying and refining like gold and precious silver and we are gold and precious silver to god he's not going to destroy us his fire of god's love the consuming fire of god's love is his love his fire is his love and it is purifying and refining to change and transform us, not to destroy us. But of course, religion uses the fear of an angry God and the fear of hell to keep us in order. 
Fear induces and produces guilt, shame, condemnation to make us feel bad. God uses, God desires us to simply let him love us. Then we can love ourselves and each other. Love one another as I have loved you. The power of unconditional love is more powerful than death. It's more powerful than Hades, Sheol, Tartarus, Gehenna, and has been already overcome. Because God's love is overcoming, overwhelming love. Hell may produce fear, but perfect love casts out fear. So even today, if you've got any fear of the future, any fear that you think you or your loved ones or even those in the past who died in your families or loved ones are, are in that place being punished, they are not. There is no fear in love and love is won, is winning and will win. And that really, really is good news, powerful good news. And that is the good news that we can all experience today. God wants an awakening to unconditional love. Have you experienced unconditional love? Have you demonstrated unconditional love? Are you living in unconditional love? Do people see your life and see a demonstration of unconditional love? Do you, like Paul, have a heavenly vision of unconditional love? I believe God wants us to be free from this concept of hell as we've known it and to present God is a loving God to the world who will experience unconditional love, not because they're afraid of being punished, because they're drawn to his love. But he's a good God, that he loves us, that he's got nothing other than good to bring into our lives. That is the God that I've met. Now, there's more to talk about around this, and I'll go into it a little bit more with some other uh, understanding around our conditioning and programming about about that concept of hell and i really do want to obviously share some of my stories and testimonies of what happened when i went there how jesus unveiled that to me how he has shown me you know and i've preached to thousands and thousands there and seen them respond so i want everyone to know you don't have to be afraid of the future you don't have to be in fear of being sent into some torment or punishment and neither should we be using those concepts to frighten people into accepting a, a God who is love. Because it is just totally inconsistent that God is love and that he would punish you forever and ever if you just don't believe in him. He believes in you. He believes in the world. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. God has reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting anything against anybody. Let's be the same. Let's have a ministry of reconciliation a ministry and power and be ambassadors of unconditional love to a world that's desperately in need of it, desperately needs to know God as love. So they can be free from the destruction that their lack of identity and their lost identity has in their lives. God wants them to be whole. He wants us to come back into family, back into relationship, back into this awesome relationship with God, who is love. So I want to just go into a little activation. And if you have any concept in your lives of fear or any even doubt over your own salvation or where you might end up or anything about your loved ones, I just want you to allow God, who is love, to begin to bring an end to that fear. And if you have doubts about what I've been teaching today, look, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. You have the right to be to believe whatever you want to believe but i would ask you sincerely to ask god about it ask him to show you the reality of life of the power of unconditional love that nothing can separate anyone from that unconditional love and what that really means in people's lives and and ask him to show you so that you can for yourself have an experience that affirms the truth of who he is as unconditional love so i just encourage you just to close your eyes just begin to just meditate and begin to slow down your breathing and just begin to think about God as love. Just be still. Come to that place where you can be still and know. Just know that God is love. Just let his love surround you right now. Let the power of his love flow over your physical body, flow into your mind, into your heart and emotions 
that love, the power of love would overshadow you. And I just ask that Father, you would reveal to everyone listening to this, the power of your love and that you would show anyone now if there's any fear in their lives, fear of you, fear of punishment, fear of judgment, fear of the future. Let your perfect love cast out fear. Love on your children in such a way that they're safe and secure in your arms of love. You will never let them go. You will never let them out of your hands of love that you are keeping them safe and secure. Just rest in that love. Let his love touch you deep within your emotions. Just let it bring healing to any, any of your past, any fear or doubt you have of the, where your loved ones are, if they've died physically. Just let the power of God's love, let him affirm the consuming fire of his love to you. Father, I ask that you'd show everyone who wishes to see what is the refining, purifying fire of your love and how death is not the end of choice. Show those who, who wish to have those experiences that you would reveal yourself, reveal the truth, unveil the truth so we can experience you. You're in a safe place. Just open up your hearts, open up your minds. Heaven is open. To set the desires of your heart of engaging the Father and let the Father lead you. Let the Father heal you, restore you, fill you with the power of his love. Overwhelming love that conquers death, that's stronger than the grave. Rest in that love. Rest in the power of that love. And truly embrace that. Just for a few moments, just wait there in the presence of God, in his love. <laughs> 